We come now to 1 Corinthians 14. We're considering the second half of it today, having considered the first half uh, last time. Uh, we're going to read from uh, verse 20, which is where, <clears throat> where our passage begins this morning. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people. And even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognise that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognise this, he is not recognised. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Let's pray. Father, we ask uh, for this passage we're considering this morning, that you give us your special wisdom for it, Lord. We need your wisdom, Lord, to understand what it's saying. Uh, we need it for all of your scriptures, Lord, and uh, even more so, surely, when uh, things aren't always quite so clear-cut. And we uh, therefore really pray, Lord, that we would uh, not misunderstand what this passage is saying. Uh, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us what you want, and uh, that we wouldn't just understand it, Lord, but it would apply to our hearts too, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So within uh, the series we're going through in 1 Corinthians, this is the fourth and final message of uh, the four on uh, spiritual gifts. Um, and uh, we've looked at a f uh, quite a few different things to do with them over the past few uh, talks, but this is the, the final one where we'll uh, wrap it all up. Um, we're going to do a, I'll do a quick recap of the other messages uh, at the end by way of a conclusion to the whole thing. Uh, rather than the beginning as I normally would. Um, but suffice to say for now that uh, last time we looked at the, uh, the balance of prophecy and tongues so that they were both important but that prophecy was better than uninterpreted tongues because it could build up the body more and that Paul's emphasis was on building up the body and edifying it. Uh, that was really important uh, from what we saw last time. And really the section we look at now carries on from that. Uh, so these two sections are linked uh, we looked at some verses from today's passage last time, um, but uh, we're going to consider um, the majority of it now. It's got some tricky verses in, um, the verses about uh, 
uh, the, what women can and can't do uh, in church and uh, these first few verses where uh, there's a possible or looks like there's a contradiction about whether tongues are for unbelievers or not uh, but we're going to consider that now and uh, we'll uh, see how we do um, well, as it says later on prophecy needs to be tested uh, teaching does as well uh, I might not get it right uh, it's very important that uh, we don't blindly accept everything we hear but we uh, search the scriptures as it says and consider uh, is what's being said right? Um, uh, not that we uh, throw tomatoes the moment we hear something that's wrong, but uh, uh, do be open to the Lord to show you if anything isn't right today. So, verse 20, Paul says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. One of the key themes of these letters, uh, particularly of uh, uh, the letters like this from Paul, is the need for us to grow as believers, not to stand still, not to be content with where we are. Uh, We're to be content with our circumstances, uh, but shouldn't be content with our spiritual growth. We should always want to uh, go further with the Lord. Uh, And one of the things that emphasises this is earlier in this letter. Uh, If you turn back to chapter 3, of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we see Paul's criticism of the Corinthians for not moving on, as they should have done. (coughs) 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? He's saying that he had to give them milk to drink, he had to give them simple explanations of things, teach them the simple basic things of the Lord, uh, because they weren't ready for meat. For the, uh, the more advanced things. Now when somebody comes to know the Lord. Uh, they need that milk. Uh, Peter tells uh, believers to seek the milk of the word. <clears throat> and obviously when we first start out. We need the basics. But Paul's criticism here. Is that even now. They're not able to receive the more advanced things. Because they've not uh, grown up. Shall we say. <laughs> spiritually. They might be adults. Humanly speaking. But they've not uh, matured. They've not moved on. Uh, We see a similar thing in Hebrews. Uh, The writer of the Hebrews says in uh, Hebrews 5 um, that he wants to explain lots of things about uh, Jesus or about Melchizedek. But he says it's hard to explain in Hebrews 5 since you have become dull of hearing. Uh, He says by this time you ought to be teachers, but you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk. And not solid food. And he goes on to say, solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Uh, And he says to press on to maturity. Uh, So there's the encouragement here not to stay with the simple things of the Lord, uh, but to move on. Not just in our understanding, but in our, our trust of the Lord, in our love for others, in everything to move on. And so Paul says, do not be children in your thinking. He does, says, he does say, in evil be infants. Uh, in evil be infants. Uh, I was reminded of uh, the verse in uh, Ephesians 5, uh, where it says, uh, it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them, by sinful people, in secret. Uh, disgraceful even to speak of them. Uh, in the same chapter, Uh, It says uh, immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Uh, There's this reminder here, actually, that we should uh, 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 not touch evil with a barge pole, uh, perhaps is one way uh, to put it. That um, We should be novices when it comes to evil. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be uh, aware of things. Uh, We need to be aware of things that are wrong. We need to be aware of deceptions so we don't go down them. Um, But uh, we shouldn't be, I mean, you might say we shouldn't be experts at breaking into houses. 
for example. Um, because clearly, um, that's something we shouldn't be interested in at all. Uh, except whatever is necessary to make sure our houses are safe. Beyond that, we don't need to know anymore because it is a sinful thing. Perhaps a silly illustration, but you get the idea uh, that we're to be uh, infants or novices in evil things. But he says in our thinking as believers, we should be mature. Uh, And that relates to what came before about the need to understand tongues, not just to think, oh, that sounds nice, but to want to understand the interpretation. But it also follows on uh, with what comes next in verse 21, where Paul references something from Isaiah. So let's turn to Isaiah 28 and see what it is uh, he's referring to. Isaiah 28, and we'll read from verse 7. Isaiah, um, obviously uh, speaking to a people who didn't want to listen, uh, whose wisdom was uh, corrupted. And here he even pictures them as being drunk. Some of them literally, but in their thinking, definitely uh, not thinking straight. Uh, Isaiah 28 and verse 7. And these also reel with wine and stagger from strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. Doesn't it sound a bit like some of the judgments made today? Uh, Some of the ways some people think. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. To whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk. Those just taken from the breast. For he says, order on order, order on order. Line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they would not listen. So the word of the Lord to them will be, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. That they may go and stumble backward, be broken, snared and taken captive. So this is the passage Paul quotes from. And it's not immediately clear uh, what it's going on about. Other than you probably got the gist that the Israelites weren't listening uh, to what Isaiah or the Lord through him was saying. It probably helps to understand that when it says order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there. uh, The Hebrew which I will attempt, is uh, Sav la Sav, Sav la Sav, Kav la Kav, Kav la Kav, Zeya Sham, Zeya Sham. That part of the message is a bit you don't test, you just accept it. Um, uh, but uh, that is uh, what the Hebrew is. Uh, however badly pronounced, the idea is it's almost uh, a nonsense. It's very repetitive, it's like child speak where they, they babble on, uh, certainly as many people would uh, take it to be. Um, And it's like uh, the Israelites are mocking Isaiah's message uh, to them. Uh, There's more than one way you could take this passage, but certainly one way is that uh, the Israelites are basically saying Isaiah is just preaching nonsense. uh, Or he's speaking to us as if we're children. and We don't need this message. What is the point in it? They're not listening. That That much is clear. And the result in verse Uh, 11 is God says, well, I will speak to this people in in a nonsense way, if you like. I'll speak to them through stammering lips and a foreign tongue, which ended up being the foreign tongue of the Babylonians. Because the Babylonians came uh, in God's judgment because the Israelites didn't listen to his message. The Babylonians came and suddenly they were invaded by an army whose speech they couldn't understand or sounded like nonsense. So however you take this passage, it's clear God is saying, well, you wouldn't accept this simple message I gave. So I will speak to you in an even more complicated way, uh, as a judgment, if you like. And that's the way we see God dealing uh, in other places. Uh, We thought uh, a few weeks ago about the idea of God giving people over, where if people are rebellious and they don't want to hear a message 
God will give them over to what they want and make it even harder for them to hear. Uh, Like Pharaoh hardened his heart and then the Lord hardened it. So it's something of a judgment that sometimes if we don't want to listen, God makes it even harder to hear. Uh, And we see Jesus saying similar things about his parables. So there's a consistent picture here. And actually, ironically, these mockers, these Israelites uh, who were mocking Isaiah, they were actually children in their thinking. They did actually need a simple message because they weren't ready to hear. And this is, I think, why Paul uh, quotes from this uh, back in Corinthians. Because he's saying in the next verse, in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 14, Tongues are therefore for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Uh, Now, I'll do my best to try and uh, um, explain this, uh, and I don't fully uh, claim to understand it myself, but uh, we see in the Bible that God talks about signs, uh, basically something that is meant to give a message to people. Uh, perhaps of warning, perhaps of judgment, uh, but God will set a sign for people to see. And some people heed it and some people don't. Uh, sometimes hard hearted people will ignore the sign. Uh, here for the Israelites, the Babylonians coming was a sign and it was a sign of judgment. They hadn't listened, so they saw another sign of the Babylonians that was a judgment on them. It's interesting in in Luke, uh, when Simeon, uh, the old man in the temple, uh, blesses the baby Jesus. And he says and prophesies to his mother, uh, this child, that's Jesus, is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Jesus was going to be a sign, a sign to the people, which many wouldn't understand and would reject. Jesus himself said in Luke 11, uh, when the crowds came around, he said, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the son of man be to this generation. And in another place, he points out about Jonah being three days in the well, in the whale and Jesus being three days Uh, In the earth. And so Jesus saying. Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. He uh, almost in effect came back from the dead. And came and spoke to them. And they heeded the sign. But Jesus was going to be a sign to the Israelites. And many were not going to heed. Even though he died and rose again. Many were going to reject him. It talks uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, in the passage, where, uh, the, ch- the letter that we're in. At the very start, Jesus, uh, Paul points out that the message of Jesus, this sign, is foolishness to some. It's something which they don't understand. You can just turn there, actually, 1 Corinthians 1 uh, and verse 21. One Corinthians 1 and verse 21. Where it says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus is the sign, a stumbling block to many Jews, stupidity to many Greeks who wanted some kind of wise system. But to those who were willing to listen, this sign is the power of God. And so to bring all this together, when Paul says that tongues are a sign to unbelievers, uh, I believe it's saying Uh, That tongues are a sign that they are not necessarily going to understand. Uh, Even something of judgment that here are people who don't want to hear from the Lord. And so what they do hear uh, is meaningless to them. 
Uh, he's saying, I believe that tongues are meant to be unintelligible to unbelievers. But for us as believers, he wants us to understand what they're saying. We, he wants us to receive the interpretation uh, as part of the, uh, the service. Uh, when we have tongues in the assembly, he wants there to be an interpretation. Because while it's a sign and a judgment on unbelievers not to understand, for us, God wants us to understand. He wants to reveal those mysteries as we uh, saw last time. Now, obviously, where the contradiction can seem to come up is that then uh, in, later in this, uh, this passage, unbelievers are again mentioned. Uh, because it says that um, if unbelievers uh, hear tongues, they will say uh, that the church is mad. But that if prophecy they hear it, they'll be convicted. And Paul has just said that prophecy is for believers and tongues is a sign to unbelievers. We've already seen that when it says they're a sign to unbelievers, it doesn't mean that it will turn them around. It will be something they don't understand. But it's interesting that when it talks about the unbelievers in verse uh, 23 and 24, it says the unbelievers or ungifted men. And it seems to me that there is a slight difference here, uh, perhaps, that the unbelievers in verse 22 who hear the sign of the tongues, uh, they uh, perhaps are not interested. But here in verse 23, unbelievers or ungifted men come into the assembly uh, and uh, there is the chance for them to hear and turn around. Now, I'm presenting to you what I believe. And I might have understood it wrongly, or there might be more than one understanding. But I just share what I think uh, Paul is saying here. And uh, I just want to quote somebody else, actually, uh, who spoke on this. Um, because I think I found what they uh, said uh, helpful. He said, The unbelievers in verse 22 are those who have rejected the word of God and closed their hearts to the truth. Tongues are a sign of God's judgment on them as they were on Israel in the passage in Isaiah. The unbelievers in verses 23 onwards are those who are willing to be taught. They are open to hear the word of God, as is evidenced by their presence in a Christian assembly. That may or may not be the correct way to interpret it, but I think it's helpful to see uh, that tongues very much can be something that are a judgment, um, but that if they come in as unbelievers... And they hear, particularly prophecy, that there is the chance for them to hear and repent and turn around. Now, what Paul says is something that can be tempting to dismiss about prophecy. Um, because uh, he says, to quote him uh, properly, uh, that uh, the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God. Declaring that God is certainly among you. Now it's very easy to think, yeah, right, like they're going to do that. Uh, we wouldn't want to say that out loud, would we? But it's tempting to think, well, I can't see people doing that just because they hear a word of prophecy. But who is speaking? Who is saying this? Uh, this is Paul. Uh, Paul knows what he's talking about. Uh, and Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we must be very careful not to dismiss what it says in the word. Paul is saying that uh, a prophecy can have this effect on people. OK, a, a, a British unbeliever might not fall on their face uh, with uh, the way we are brought up not to uh, show lots of emotion. Uh, but it's saying that it will have an effect. That the Lord can strike powerfully into people's hearts. We know that because elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about God's word being living and active, being powerful, able to divide between soul and spirit. When God's word comes to people, God's direct word, it can be powerful to work in them. I trust it's powerful working in us this morning. Uh, and if it's so for us, it certainly can be for non-believers too. And so whatever uh, Paul is saying here, however you interpret this passage, uh, the message is clear that prophecy is a powerful thing. Prophecy is a powerful thing. Tongues can be uh, confusing. If they're interpreted, they can be a great blessing. But prophecy certainly 
uh, can do great things and work great things uh, in us, uh, disclosing the secrets of our hearts, convicting us, but also very often giving us fresh direction uh, and encouragement. Well, we need to uh, move on for time. Uh, if you have any questions afterwards, ask Ray. I mean, um, uh, feel free to uh, ask afterwards. Uh, but we need to come on. Uh, we're going to skip the next section and come back to it afterwards. Uh, I want to finish with the practicalities. We come on to uh, a nice easy section on uh, women keeping silent in the churches. <laughs> ah, this gets better, doesn't it? Um, and we've already uh, looked at this a bit because we looked at uh, the issue of head covering. Uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians and so uh, do listen to that message uh, to see what we uh, thought about there Um, but the message that Paul seems to be saying here is that women aren't to speak and that's how you might take it uh, at face value of course we need to remember that he didn't write in English he wrote it in Greek so that's one thing to bear in mind we also need to bear in mind that he wrote it to uh, one culture with a certain understanding But again, as we said before, we mustn't dismiss things as just cultural uh, if it's the word of God. And especially if you see it again and again. So let's try and see uh, what he's saying here. The context of this passage is talking about uh, spiritual gifts. uh, And he's just talked about testing prophecy and about people bringing teaching in. So there's a whole lot of things uh, going on here. We need to remember uh, at this time that uh, women very much were restricted. Uh, They were often not educated, so they might not have had the same level of understanding as many men. Uh, They were often discouraged from saying anything in public. So for women to suddenly be speaking would have been uh, quite a a big thing, maybe an offensive thing uh, to people coming into the church. So we need to uh, bear that in mind as well. Uh, some Jewish uh, people, some people in Jewish circles, even thought it was a sin uh, to teach a woman. Um, yes, I know. So believe it or not, they, 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 some people would think that uh, that actually it was just for the men to be taught. Uh, so it's good to see that uh, Paul is very much saying that uh, the women can learn. He's not saying that they shouldn't be educated. Uh, so that's one thing uh, to take away uh, from this. And uh, we also need to remember that Paul isn't a woman hater. He isn't a woman hater. Um, We see in other places in the scriptures him referring very affectionately uh, to women who he's worked with. Uh, He acknowledges some women as his fellow workers. He uh, uh, talks about Priscilla uh, and Aquila, uh, Priscilla being female, uh, about uh, her being a a fellow worker and uh, commends her. Uh, He mentions other women as well in in Philippians. Um, So it's not that he is not interested in women at all. Um, But he is bringing an important message here. We do need to uh, think uh, what he's saying. Uh, Let's look at a passage in 1 Timothy that might shed a bit of light on it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. Where it says a similar thing but uh, perhaps adds a bit more clarity. 1 Timothy 2 verse 11. Paul speaking again. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. Now we know in Titus, Paul encourages the older women to teach the younger women. So he's encouraging there to do teaching. But he says here... That he doesn't allow a woman to teach a man, uh, to have authority over a man. Not because all women don't know as much as all men. It's not at all what he's saying. He says the reason is because Adam was first created and then Eve. So it's not Paul laying down his own beliefs. This is Paul saying right at the beginning, God set up a system. Which we may not or may, may or may not personally think is what we would do. But that is what God did in his perfect wisdom and choice. God made this system of Adam and then Eve. And so Paul says, because of that, I don't allow a a woman to be in authority uh, over a man. So we can't just dismiss this as cultural. 
Because Paul is pointing right back to creation and saying that is why. Although culture plays a part in how we understand this, we can't just dismiss it like that. Now Paul also says back in our passage, um, he says, if I can find it, uh, uh, women are to subject themselves just as the law also says. So what is he saying here? Now, when we think of the law, you heard, Dave, you heard Dave speak on this recently, that sometimes the law can mean just the Mosaic law. And sometimes it can mean the whole of the Old Testament. Well, just a few verses earlier, Paul used the law to talk about Isaiah. So it's not just talking about the Mosaic law necessarily. Again, we have to think right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. We have the account uh, of, uh, of the fall. And to the woman... In Genesis 3 verse 16, to Eve he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Must remember that the men did not get off scot-free. This was part of the woman's curse. The man's curse was to work and to work hard. Uh, And for that to be difficult as well as death to everybody uh, at the end of their lives. So right at the beginning, God sets up this system. Adam made first, and the woman told that her desire would be for her husband. So that's the first place in the law where we see it. We see it reflected in aspects of Moses' law. Uh, For example, uh, when it talks about vows in Numbers 30, uh, it says, if a wife makes a vow, which was very serious in the Lord's sight, and he expected it to be fulfilled, if a wife made a vow... A husband heard it and disagreed with it. He could say, no, I don't uh, think that should stand. And the Lord would free her from that. He wouldn't expect her to do it because her husband, who had authority over her, could challenge that. Not that we're saying that necessarily applies today, but the principle there uh, is again seen. And in 1 Peter, not the Old Testament, but referring to the Old Testament, Peter also talks about this. Uh, In 1 Peter 3 and verse 5, he's already been talking about uh, the way women uh, should present themselves. He also talks to the men, but in 1 Peter 3 and verse 5, he says, In this way in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. So Peter commends Sarah for the attitude she had towards her husband. Again, it's not just Paul saying this. This is Peter, another founding apostle, uh, saying it. So the principle Paul is pointing out is that the message of the Bible is one that says a woman is not to have authority uh, over a man. Uh, So again, we cannot dismiss this uh, as cultural. But on the other hand... I don't believe this is saying that women are not to speak at all. Uh, And uh, the reason, as you've heard uh, Ray mention before, is that just earlier in this letter to Corinthians, Paul has said uh, about the women being covered when they pray or prophesy. Implying that they are to pray and to prophesy. Uh, And uh, you might think that uh, that might be talked about at home, but of course... Uh, What is the use in prophesying at home? Seems to me that uh, he's talking about in the church. So would Paul contradict himself in his own letter later on, change his mind? I don't think so. I think the best explanation we can see for a difficult passage is Paul is saying that women are not to teach. Perhaps even saying that when the others judge the prophecies, that that is for the men or the leaders Uh, to do perhaps that's the relevance in this section Um, but the attitude that the women are called to show uh, is one of quietness not necessarily of silence but of shall we say uh, how should we put this Um, not being uh, rowdy perhaps Um, not uh, challenging authority unnecessarily I'm really having to tread carefully here aren't I Uh, but uh, the, the attitude is one of respect Just as Paul called them to wear a head covering to show their respect for God's authority and for men not to 
as a sign of, of respect for God's system. Uh, so uh, Paul calls on the women uh, to have a respectful attitude. And the only thing we should add, of course, is that, again, the men do not get off lightly from this. We've always, always said before that when uh, wives are called to submit, men are called to lead and to make the difficult decisions and to take the responsibility for it, to protect, to lay down their lives. But also, we're all as believers called to submit to authority, to our bosses, to the government, to each other as believers, to leaders in the church, to God. So uh, let's not take this out of context, if I can uh, put it that way. I hope this has shed some light on what is Paul is saying. And again, um, ask somebody, preferably not me, uh, after this uh, about uh, what you think uh, this is saying if you are not sure. No, please do ask me if you're not sure and I'll refer any I'm not sure about. So, come to a slightly easier section now. The final section, uh, which is a bit quicker. In verse 26, we come to some practicalities. Uh, it's one of the few places where we see an insight into a church service. Not this is saying necessarily this is how they all must be all the time. But here is what Paul's expectation is. He says that when they come together as a church, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. A psalm speaking in some way of some kind of song, uh, perhaps a hymn. Some kind of song, some kind of melody, uh, teaching, something of uh, explaining things or um, passing on things to others. A revelation might well be a prophecy. Uh, a tongue and interpretation we've uh, already considered. Uh, so he says different people should have these different things. He talks about each one. Again, a reminder that it's not just for the special few, if there are a special few. In the church. It's for everybody. Each one can bring these things. We do have to point out. Of course with the caveat. With the teaching that we, Paul has said. Uh, that that is uh, for uh, the men. And, and particularly for the elders. Who are called uh, to teach. But he says each one can bring. These different things. But that all of them should be done. For edification. Again this is the thing. To bring home. This is not to show off. Even if our meeting is full of these things, as we would hopefully long they would be, it's not so any of us should have glory. It's not so we should think, oh, isn't our church good? It's so that we can be built up, so we can edify each other. And so he goes on and says that there should be two or three at the most who speak in a tongue and each in turn. <coughs> this is not to be a free for all like perhaps it was beforehand in the Corinthian church. This is not where everybody sees who can show off and bring these tongues. This is to be done <coughs> in an orderly way so that everyone benefits. We don't want anybody to miss out on what is being said. So he says it should be done in, a, in turn, taken in turns, very British of course, but uh, it applies here as well. And one must interpret, reminding us there is not no point, but there is little point in tongues being given in a meeting if they can't then be interpreted. So he even says, if there's no interpreter, if you know in the church that nobody will interpret this, to keep silent. And this is actually quite relevant because I spoke to somebody about this a while ago. Uh, and I was saying, well, sometimes the first time you bring a tongue in a church, especially if you're new, you might not know that there's no interpreter. But if it becomes a clear pattern, that perhaps you might think, OK, well, I will bring my tongues between myself and the Lord. And we all pray that an interpreter is raised up. But Paul says, if you know there's no interpreter, keep silent and speak just to God. Again, he says, let just two or three prophets speak. Uh, again, that there's an order here. And he says the others must pass judgment. The prophecy must be tested. It is not just to be taken and said, OK, that's great. That must be from the Lord. It is to be tested. And if it's found to be true, it should be taken on board. Clearly, there's something of a spontaneity here. Uh, there's a flexibility. Uh, he even says, uh, if a revelation is made to one who is seated, uh, another, the first one, must keep silent. So if somebody really needs to bring something, 
whoever has already stood up uh, must give way. Don't quite know exactly what he's envisioning here, but there's a flexibility here. A willingness to say, well, actually, what you have to say is more important. I'll sit down and let you speak. Uh, a willingness to give in to each other, uh, to prefer each other, as it says elsewhere. But there's that flexibility, again, so that the body can be built up. That is the emphasis in the whole passage. As he says, you can all <laughs> prophesy one by one, so all may learn and all may be exhorted. He also points out a very important thing in our day to day. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. It's not that we are suddenly taken on by something uncontrollable, mm. that we just have no choice but to do something. We will certainly feel the Lord's prompting, um, but it's not that we're kind of taken over like an evil spirit takes over somebody. He says they are subject to the people who bring them. Because God is not a God of confusion. And the reason I say about it is important today is you might have heard of, of churches and situations where there is uh, maybe uncontrollable laughter. Uh, or uh, they talked about people barking like dogs uh, in one thing to do with Toronto. Uh, where they just couldn't help it and they couldn't help falling down and other things. That is not of God, Paul says. Because our spirits are subject to us. God wants to work through us. But we should be in control and not feeling carried away and unable to do anything. The final thing to note is it says, as in all the churches of the saints. This is not just specific to Corinth. This is not just Paul's belief. He says it is what all the churches do. And he even goes on to say... Uh, which I have lost for the moment uh, in our passage. Um, but uh, near the very end of the passage, he even challenges them and says, you should be recognising what I say as the Lord's commandment. Not as just from me, but if you truly are spiritual, if you truly understand, if you are truly somebody who is recognised as being uh, a discerning believer, you should recognise that what I'm saying, says Paul, is the Lord's commandment. So what he's saying about gifts about women, about the order of the church, is from the Lord. And I think that's an important way to end, to remind ourselves that this is not just Paul's opinion. And so in the final couple of minutes, just to remind us very, very briefly of all the things we've looked at uh, over these uh, few talks, in the hope it encourages and challenges us once more uh, to seek these things. We saw in chapter 12 in the first message uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit has various roles to play. One of them is to bring gifts. We saw there's a variety of gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to give some to one person, some to another. He wants to distribute it so that everybody can play their part. We saw that they're for the profit of everybody and that nobody should feel inferior because different people have different roles to play. We have the person who's the eye, the person who's the hand, the person who's the foot, as he puts it. Nobody should feel they're not part of a body. God has a place for each of us and he wants to use you in it. We saw that nobody should be jealous of other people's gifts, though we should desire them. And we saw that we should suffer with those who suffer. We should feel each other's pain as a family. In chapter 13, we saw that actually, even more important than spiritual gifts... Is love. Spiritual gifts are important, but even more important is love. So however good we are, to put it that way, in gifts, if we're not bringing them in love, it is meaningless. It's actually wrong, because we're not bringing them in a right way. So love is primarily important, but also gifts. We saw that balance that Paul is trying to bring. Uh, we saw that to have that kind of love for others, we need to live a crucified life. We can't love ourselves and love others. It's impossible. We have to lay down our own lives to love other people. Last time in chapter 14, we saw the importance of edification, of building each other up. We saw surprisingly that Paul's emphasis when talking about worship wasn't actually on God, although that is what it's most about. His emphasis to the Corinthians was on the importance of building each other up. 
And so we should remember that our worship times mostly focus on the Lord, but also are a chance to encourage each other. And it has an important role there. We saw that tongues are mysteries, but God wants to reveal mysteries to us as believers as we go on with him. And we saw why we say amen. It's not just a pattern, but we saw we say it to show the Lord that we agree with somebody's prayer. And that we don't say it if we don't think the prayer was right. If we think there's something, particularly something seriously wrong with a prayer, we don't say it. But if we agree, we say a hearty amen uh, to what has been said to identify with it. And of course, we've seen what we've seen today, which I hope will be a bit fresher in your mind. And so if you take it all together, Paul has spent three whole chapters talking about spiritual gifts. Yes, Corinth needed it. Yes, there seem to have been abuses. But it should speak to us. I don't know when we'll next consider a thing of spiritual gifts. I know Ray is hopefully going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in more detail soon to follow this on. But, you know, it might be a long time before these things are mentioned again. Let's not leave it until the next time to feel convicted and encouraged to seek them. Paul says, desire them. Seek them earnestly. So let's not miss an opportunity now to ask the Lord for them. To lay our lives down in love for others. And to seek to build each other up with the gifts God has made available to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that you've put uh, available to us. We see many uh, pitfalls. Uh, We see uh, many things that are not uh, completely clear necessarily uh, in these passages, Lord. Uh, But we don't want to be put off by that, Lord. We pray, Lord, that whatever our understanding of these things are, that you would give us that childlike uh, faith and desire, Lord, uh, that looks to you, our Heavenly Father, and desires good things from your hand. Lord, we thank you you've made these things available to us. We confess we are um, in need of learning more about these things. We're in need of desiring them more. Uh, We're in need of them working more in our meetings, Lord. We do want to be edified. We do want to to grow up and mature and be encouraged and be convicted wherever is needed. And so we pray for our body here, for ourselves, Lord, that you would grant more gifts to us, Lord. That you would do whatever work you need to in us first to give us those gifts if there are things that are in the way of them. And Lord, we pray that we would be greatly built up as a result, Lord. For we bless you and praise you, Lord, that your desire is for us to grow and to be with you in your kingdom one day. Thank you, Lord. Amen.